Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Gray, the Director of Programming for Times Talks, the New York Times live conversation series that pairs New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of film, theater, music, art, fashion, literature, and science. To find out who's coming next, go to timestalks.com and subscribe to our newsletter. Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event, which is part of our Times Talks Downtown series presented by Cadillac. I hope you'll join us for a cocktail reception following this evening's program. Tonight, we're thrilled to be welcoming actor Robert Patterson and acclaimed filmmakers Josh and Benny Safdie as they riff on their upcoming film, Good Time, lauded by the New York Times chief film critic, Manola Dargis, as pure cinematic pleasure. In what many are describing as Patterson's best performance yet, the London-born actor plays Constantine Nikis, AKA Connie, a calamitously inept bad guy who during one terrible New York adventure leaves ruins in his wake. You'll hear much more about tonight's guest from our moderator, Milena Rysik, a culture reporter for the New York Times. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Milena Rysik, Josh and Benny Safdie, and Robert Patterson. Hi, everybody. Hi. Thank you all for joining us. I'm so excited <laughs> to be here with all of you and with these guys to talk about their new movie. Now, you maybe know a little bit about the movie already, um, and we'll talk a little bit more in detail about what it's about, and hopefully we'll have time for some questions at the end, and there'll be mics so you guys can be heard out in the world on Facebook Live. So welcome, everybody. Thank uh, you guys for joining me. Happy it's to be here. Yeah, 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 this is a amazing honor. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've <laughs> always dreamed of being in a Cadillac showroom. I actually, we were told that we receive a Cadillac. Yeah. It's like an Oprah. <laughs> yes, exactly. you. <laughs> no, it's not really what's going to happen. But we are here to talk about the movie. Um, it came together in an unusual way. Normally, you know, a director or screenwriter writes a movie, they send it out to stars, they cross their fingers, they hope that you know, the people that they want will sign on. The opposite kind of happened for this movie. Rob, you approached Josh and Benny, and Josh and Benny say which one is? I'm Josh. And I'm Benny. Yeah. It's OK, our dad uh, never knows. Yeah. <laughs> so Rob, you approached these guys and said, I want to be in a film of yours without knowing much about them. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> just, uh, I knew absolutely nothing. Um, I just saw this photograph and it really, it really connected to me. Oh, it's a lot of reverb. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's kind of that's interesting. Um, yeah. We're gonna sample this later. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, I just, I just really love this photo. And then I, I, I had an intuitive feeling about it, and then saw the trailer for their last movie and. I just wanted to do something which had very, very, very high energy and high intensity. And when I saw the trailer for Heaven Knows What, I was like, ah, oh, it's one of the best trailers ever. And uh, yeah, I just, I knew, I knew as soon as I saw that, I wanted to do something. Should mo note that you saw the movie. Later. Later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. If you, well, if they, you I mean, just they, picked off of trailers. Yeah, but the, but the, en the energy of, the, there's also the unusual thing about this, which is a strange thing about this trailer and this movie as well. It's like normally you see a trailer that's like, Really explosive, and you know it's three minutes long. I mean, so you, most people can't, can't, or don't even want to <laughs> just have the, the at, run an entire movie at the max the whole time. Um, but they can kind of keep that level of uh, intensity for, for ninety minutes, and that's kind of what this and um, the last movie was. So you guys, when you got this call from Rob. Uh, to be in a movie, what did you did you think? Nah, this is a prank call. What did you think? Uh, pr not so different. Not so far from that. We, I was in Texas, like we were about to, to premiere the, the, our previous movie at at South by Southwest, and and uh, I was sharing a, a hotel room with our producer Sebastian Ramer Clark, and I got an email out of the blue from him, basically saying it was very much in. When you see the movie, there's a, a speech that Connie gives uh, this actress, this uh, younger character, Crystal, uh, and he says very similarly what he said to us in our email, like, hey, I saw this still uh, 
of your movie, and, and I don't quite know why, but I feel this innate connection to it, and it feels like it's tied to my purpose, and I feel like you're now tied to my purpose, and it was very, um, there was a lot of mysticism in it, and it didn't feel like an act, but my initial reaction was, Rob's, Pattinson's not right for anything in this other movie we were trying to make. So we, we I almost like, didn't respond. Yeah, we talked, we're like, should we respond? And then Steve was, Steve was like, yes, you know, you respond. So, yeah. And so. uh, I mean, we, we just like, you know, when we're on set, we, we like to kind of work with what's coming at us. And, uh, you know, we, we, we met with him, you know, and, and, and uh, that was, there was an immediate kind of, uh, an understanding that uh, you know, there's a public perception of who someone is, and that's usually very far most of the time from who they are as real people. And the vibe we got immediately was this: there was a mania there, uh, a desire, a genuine desire to discover things, and um, and also this kind of wounded war veteran quality to him that he would never want. He was trying to not be seen and scuttle around, and and uh, that was interesting. And and. You know, we had this desire. We wanted to make a piece of pulp. We wanted to do a genre movie. We knew that. We knew what that one. We wanted to take these things that we learned in our previous movies and documentaries, like Lenny Cook taking real life, and then Heaven Knows What, which is kind of like a hybrid movie uh, using uh, a, a real life story, reenacting those lives, and take those kind of formal things that we learned there and bring them to like a genre, but but do it. You know, kind of do it, make a thriller, a thriller that feels dangerous in a way. It was, yeah, and, uh, and you know, his star power was, you know, definitely allowed us to think like that because we could, you know, you could get a budget to do something like yeah, that. Yeah, just I guess Rob kind of said I, he wanted to disappear into a world, and I think that what he responded to from that still, even like I could never even make that jump, you know, from a still to making the the commitment that you wanted to make, but stay, which is incredible. But just to kind of disappear into a world, he's like, I want to be in a world like that. And that was what he told us when he sat down. And we, we believed him. And we're going to like, we said, don't, like, don't, don't test us. We'll, we'll really take this to the next <laughs> level. And we'll go as far as you say, plus 10. You know? <laughs> so some of the story is based in real life. Tell everybody a little bit about what the film is about. So, so Good Time is, is about, Rob plays a character named Connie who was recently released from prison. Uh, and he's uh, in prison, he had this kind of uh, idea that, that you know, he was almost like a born again. He had seen the, the ugliness of, of society in, in jail and, and he was going to kind of write his life and he thought that writing his life was through his brother that he was slightly estranged from. That's the backstory. Uh, and, but, and Connie is a romantic psychopath who is obsessed <laughs> with this idea of love with his brother. So he removes him from a, a, a psychiatric center because he doesn't believe that's how you can actually help someone with, men, with the developmental disabilities and uh, you know, wants to induce an idea of independence with him. And he thinks that the best way to do this by bringing him to rob a bank. Uh, maybe not the best idea, uh, but it, the intentions were, were maybe good. And, and they rob this bank, and it goes wrong. And uh, it leads to uh, the disabled brother in, ends up in jail, and, and Connie ends up on the run, and he spends the yeah. Uh, one night in the film, just doing everything he can to try to right that wrong. Yeah, get bail to get him out of jail, yeah. basically. So. And some of that is based on uh, real stories from people in Correct. prison. Correct. Correct. Documentary mm -hmm. things like that, right? Yeah. Well, I I had was I was reading I was reading a Executioner song by Norma Mailer, and then the this book in the Belly of the Beast, which was these prison letters that were written to him in preparation for Executioner song. And his introduction to that book, he you know, mentions that you know America should be worried that that this that that the penal system is actually breeding a specific type of of uh, kind of uh, isolation, and and if we weren't careful, it'll become our national anthem. And at the same time, I was downloaded a bunch of episodes of Cops, every episode of Cops actually, <laughs> and uh, and and yes, and Buddy Duress, who appears in the movie, he's an, a fantastic actor who we worked with on Heaven Knows What. He was uh, a good friend of mine, and he, he's a good friend of mine, and he was. Uh, locked up in prison, and while he was in prison, I talked to him every day, and he was talking about how slow time was moving. So I said, "Why don't you, you know, write down, you know, treat every day like it's research?" And he's like, "For what?" I said, "For for anything, for a book." And he started to write these kind of, you know, daily routines, and uh, it was 
exposing to see what happens in prison, what society kind of devolves into. And yeah, we, we met with a, um, I'm just remembering that this one guy from the Fortune Society who where he works with um, other inmates coming out of jail to try and get back into society. And I think Rob asked him, like, what was the one thing that you would remembered that was a very strange thing that you didn't realize would affect you coming back? And he said, I would, I would bump into tables and knock things over all the time. And it was like, well, like it, it, we'd want to know more about that. He said, because everything in prison is bolted down. And so you're walking around, and you're hitting everything, and it doesn't matter. There's no cause and effect. And then you come out in the world, and you hit something, and the table gets knocked over, or the chair gets knocked over, and it's, it's disorienting. So. I mean, that's where the title came, by the way, from. It's a prison term, good time. Now, originally, the first iteration took place in prison. It's people, if you behave well, you get released on your good time. And the irony of it in America is that you know, recidivism is high, and 90% of people who are released on their good time end up violating parole, and they get sent back, and they serve their good time. So you guys actually went to a prison to do some research. What was that experience like, Rob? Uh, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, it's, uh, we went to every, like, absolutely everywhere you could go into prison. And for hours and hours. This wasn't a Hollywood tour. <laughs> it was great. And we were allowed to talk, talk to anybody and just watching how the warden interacted with people. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was definitely, it was also, I kind of went semi in character. I, I, I didn't really know what the character was at the time, but just to kind of see if um, people in prison would really, uh, would really notice. It was kind of, I never told you this thing, but there was a, uh, uh -oh. this, <laughs> this, you know that movie, the Steve Buscemi movie, uh, um, Animal Factory. Oh yes, yeah, we talked about that, yeah. But there's a, they talked about the casting of it with um, Eddie Fermo. Mm -hmm. And they basically, there was another guy who, there was between two guys, and they took both of them to the prison and let the prisoners decide. Amazing. <laughs> the thing. And it was kind of, and they all looked at Eddie Fermo and they're like, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> and, I, and so I was kind of had it in the back of my mind. So you but, felt like you got prison cred because yeah, they well, accepted well, you. Yeah, but I was kind of just hoping that no one would call me out. But yeah. I mean, uh, People and thought we worked for the city. Yeah, yeah. Everyone was asking for their lawyers and stuff. Like, so we kind of had like notebooks and things. <laughs> and, like, it was it was also an early costume test you were wearing. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. We, we end up using some of that clothes in the movie. Yeah, like the Echo hoodie and stuff. But yeah, the, I mean, everyone kind of thought it was. The people were very confused about what we were doing because I remember people. People thought you were sort of taking me because I'd been arrested for something, and like someone who one of the the warden, the assistant warden, was like, "What do you what do you do? Like, do you, like you're a burglar, right?" And I was like, "Why would I be doing a tour of a prison?" Yeah. Um, well, they well in her defense, uh, Raleigh Moses is a I mean, she actually is a warden at Rikers Island now, uh, became a, a friend of of uh, myself and one of the producers, Sebastian. She was you know very aware of what we were trying to do and and. Uh, you know, she just she's in the system. She knows what it is. She actually appears; her voice appears in the movie. She's a uh, plays the operator at Elmhurst Hospital, uh, uh, but she she knew I, I had the in, I actually had an interest in bringing someone else at one. I'd been there a bunch of times already, and I wanted to bring uh, someone just to kind of. But that person's like, I'm not going and hanging out with the warden. If I go back there, people are going to see me hanging out with the warden. It's going to be horrible for me. And at, you know, just <laughs> also, at, at one point, the, there was a lot more of the movie that took place in prison and in jail. Yeah. And so, I guess I should ask, was it your first time? It was not your first time in jail, but what about you guys? Have you been well, it, it, Josh actually scheduled multiple visits to the jail. So I'd been there before. Rob came, so as a professional. Yes, yes, not. <laughs> I, I, Josh has Josh has been there once before, not as a professional. <laughs> and uh, I, when I was I, doing a, one of the tours, I have a habit of walking with, especially in buildings like that, with my hands behind my back. So I was walking with, at the time, he was the one of the, the deputy commissioner of jails, a guy who I met through some strange research. Uh, a really interesting guy who, who actually uh, lowered recidivism in Connecticut. Now he's running prisons in, in Nevada. He, I was walking with him, and we were walking through, I guess, like a, a day room. And I saw someone I knew. And they saw me, and they're like, oh, man, they got you. And I, was like, <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying it to be funny, but it was a weird moment because I didn't want, you know, there's like, a, you know, the, the social dynamics are very fickle that in, in, in uh, in the penal system, so yeah, but it was a weird moment. Yeah. And Rob, you were clean. Yeah, no, I, I haven't, luckily. We did try, we were gonna do 
initially uh, we were doing all these different makeup tests that need to look more like Benny, and we were uh, going to do like a fake nose and blah blah blah. Thank and you. Um, and then <laughs> Benny plays your brother in the movie, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, we tried. We were think I really wanted to to stay like, overnight in the prison just to see if the if uh, the makeup would would work um, to you know so you could actually experience it for kind of a, a character thing and also just to, just to see if you know it didn't everyone's not calling out a fake nose or whatever. Um, but yeah, it was very very difficult to get that. And I think even in, even they said in protective custody that like it's too dangerous that like, you can't. There's no way to guarantee that it would be safe, and so. Uh, nothing so, would have so, happened. Yeah, nothing would have happened. But uh, Sebastian was like, "Why don't you just get arrested? It's way easy." <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I considered for a second. <laughs> mm. All right, let's take a look at a clip from the movie. This is not a prison scene, but mm. we'll take a look. So I told you about my brother, yeah. Yeah. I told you about the program he's forced to attend and how he shouldn't be there. Yeah. Now everybody involved that doesn't know what the fuck they're doing and he fucking hates it. It's hey, Costa Rica is only please, four and a Please, half could you just put it down for two seconds? Just listen to what I'm saying. Look, something happened. I don't know exactly what, but one of the therapists was abusing him and I guess he must have lashed out violently and he really hurt the guy. But now this guy's gonna press charges. My brother's been arrested. He's being held at Rikers Island. Oh my God, that's awful. I know. You have no idea. So I just got to get him out of there before something bad happens. So he could get killed in there. I'm just a little short in the bail money right now. How short? It's like, it's like a few thousand. Okay, that's not bad. Huh? That's why I was, I was just hoping your mom's credit card could cover the rest of it. Oh. <laughs> so one thing I love about that moment is we see this hustler in the middle of his hustle. Mm. And we as the audience know he's pulling one over on her. And you get the sense, without much backstory being given about that relationship with Jennifer Jason Lee's character, that it's probably not the first time he's kind of pulled the wool over her eyes. And I love that moment where you kind of catch your voice there, where you're, I don't know, are you thinking in character, like, I'm pulling this story together as I'm saying it? Is it hard to lie on top of acting? Uh, um, I mean, I think the strange thing about Connie, which I found kind of interesting at, uh, right from the beginning, was that he, you know, like, like any kind of con man, uh, Every every lie is a truth, but I think to Connie it becomes almost more of a truth than uh, than the average liar. Um, I think as he has he's so uh, he has so much conviction to his purpose that like he convinces himself very 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 quickly. And I think all these times there's this scene and there's another scene when I'm talking to a, a, a cop in the hospital, and it was we were talked about it a lot at the beginning when it's he's lying but he's not lying it's like he's there was a lot of the stuff which is cut out of the movie where he literally has like visions of things and it's kind of he'll describe it as a vision but I think in some ways he can uh, it's sort of, he'll, he'll create these stories in his head and it's kind of it's no longer a lie to him as he's saying this this these uh, this story it's like it's it's true and he's like you know it's like when you I don't know if anybody else does this, but like sometimes when, if you started crying by accident, this is how it was, it's pretty lame, but like when I used to try and get myself to cry at movies when I first started acting, you kind of make it, yourself throw up a bit and then look in, look in a, a mirror and you look like, you look upset and it makes you upset just because you look upset. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I think, like, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> but, that's a good tip. I feel like that's acting students take <laughs> note. That's like, what I, you could do. I think yeah. that I think that Connie, in a weird way, he because of the traumas of his life and his experiences, he can kind of he has this he can see the matrix in a weird way. Yeah. So I think that he genuinely believes that story. I mean, it's an interesting thing when we wrote that that story. It's almost like that is the why he almost saw that story unfold so many times, and that's why he took his brother out of the facility. Yeah, yeah. So it's almost like 
it, it, in a way, it isn't a lie. Of course, it's a ruse. It is, in the end, it's like, oh, he's just being a cocksucker, excuse me, yeah. but like, you know, he's it's just out, being. It's out of genuine concern, though. Like, it's kind of, and it's like when you say, when you, it's like, you know, if you, if you get caught in an exaggeration, it's like, well, I had to say this, because otherwise you wouldn't do the thing which I wanted you to do. So you have to forgive the lie. Right? And it's literally like, no, you're just, you're just lying. There's no right. difference. It's like, well, it's like I needed to get that result. Um, I think, you know, Connie is a character who forgives himself very, very easily. <laughs> forgives and forgets. Like, <laughs> forget everything. <laughs> um, Jennifer is amazing in that scene mm. as well. I mean, she re like you said, you can feel, I mean, that was how we uh, got her on board. Is I didn't send her the script. I sent her this insane backstory between her and Connie and how they met their first, I wrote dialogue for their first time that they met. And she's like, is this the scene, is this the dialogue that you want me to do, is this the scene? I was like, no, 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 that's the dialogue from a scene that never, that happened in their lives. And that's the movie in your head and it, not in... Exactly, right. but, it, it, but you feel it in that cab scene. And I really love that she's looking at destinations on a screen. Yeah. Like, she really, and you, yeah, you she can really tell does as well believe. that Connie, Connie, Connie is invested in her as well. I mean, it's like, it's not just a kind of, it's not just a little sleight of hand trick and stuff. You can tell that there's a pause and it's kind of, you know, even though you're, you're still, you know, they're both getting something out of it. Like, uh, you know, and she's just in, she's in her, in her own world as well. I think, well, yeah, what, what really, what mentally really. Mentally ill people attract, we're, we're yeah, attracted what, to each other. You what, know? what hits me with her is that she really does believe him. You know, she believes what he's saying. So she's looking at these places because she really does think that, oh, I'm going to, I'm finally going to go on this trip. Even though the past has always said, this guy's going to take advantage of you. But she doesn't want to confront that idea. And to see it on her face where she realizes that this is, a, oh, again, you know, it's, mm. it's, it's really like. Jennifer oh. is, that character, Corey, is based on someone we know very well, too. So it was an easy thing to write a backstory for. Well, a lot of the characters in the movie have good intentions. And the, and the end the, to which they're trying to get, you know, is maybe, maybe a positive. But the means are usually just destructive mm. and terrible. And they're not, especially Connie might not be a very likable character. Is it important for you to, to like your characters? Or is it more fun to play someone who's just hateable? Uh, I mean, I've never seen him as a hateable person. I mean, maybe, I don't know, like it's kind of, I guess you just have to establish the parameters of what, how the character exists for you, and he—he, he, it's not. I mean, no, nothing in it is. It doesn't defy logic any of his actions, and I think as soon as you defy logic, then it's like, well, if he's not a, um, he's in some ways kind of psychotic, but like, uh, he's, he's not in my eyes like a conventional psychopath. He's not like a kind of like a sadist or something. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not pleasurable, these, it's like, which I think as soon as something negative becomes a pleasurable thing, I, mean, I guess you, then you kind of take that into account. But I mean, with him, it's all like, he's just, you know, has just a lot of narcissism and, uh, uh, and he's kind of, he's in his own world. Like he's just, like, but, you know, he's like everybody, everybody, everybody excuses themselves. You, you're, you're taught if you go to therapy or whatever, like you'll have to learn to forgive yourself. And it's literally like Connie's like taking that to the nth degree. Like, and just say, you know, well, no matter what, he forgives himself. And, th and there's something really strange, like when those two guys broke out of prison upstate, David, Richard Matt and David Sweat, you, you kind of saw society almost like rooting for them to get to the border. And you get caught up in it, but then you realize like when they got caught, then wow, that guy's a murderer. And yeah. he like senselessly just like ran over somebody. And you realize all these things after the fact, but you get caught up in this movement and this feeling that's created by them and created by the world around them that you almost don't have time to look at it and question it. It's also exciting, kind of, I mean, for me anyway, to get to, with a story like that, if you can make uh, an audience complicit into, into a character's actions, I mean, they don't really realize it's like when, uh, when like, I, with the, in the Adventureland stuff, when, you know, beating, when I got arrested, I mean, I was, when I didn't get arrested, yeah. I mean, literally, you had to like say that kind of because I was just like, so I don't even know how to explain that. But, like, the, yeah. the the sequence when you when uh, the cops are coming in, or the uh, yeah yeah when um, when it's just how am I going to get out of this? Yeah yeah when they just arrest they just completely take it verbatim. I mean, I literally have my hands are covered in blood. Like, and I'm just like, oh, uh, yeah, the guy, um, you know, he's just in here on drugs. And like, they don't even, the cops don't even question me. No, yeah, that would, I mean, that's, that's like, you know, in terms of the character being likable or not. I, I mean, I think that the intentions, Connie's intentions, uh, 
you know, like I said, I, I almost agree with his, his intention to induce this idea of independence in his brother. It's the execution that's maybe wrong. I think he, his skill set and what he knows, I think, again, from being in prison and, and almost seeing uh, society in, a, in such a naked way was very exposing to him. And I, and, and I think you're, re you're referring to when the cops are coming in and Barkod's character's on the mm -hmm. ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that what he does in that moment is, you know, as, like, I remember when I showed uh, Buddy that scene for the first time, he's like, oh, this is really messed up. And I was like, yeah, it, isn't it? And, and he said, yeah, it's just crazy. Because when you look at the optics of it, which is Connie, when you're in prison, you immediately, like, the optics are, are everything. And he knows that these two white cops who are coming into Adventureland, he's guilty. He's the, by far the guiltiest person. Him and Ray are wildly guilty. He knows what Wait, it will look like. Wait, don't give away all the spoilers. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Sorry, gonna, sorry. In sorry. case these guys want to watch the But movie. I think it is interesting to say that, that Connie understands how society perceives a white person right. versus a person of color. And, and he knows that, you know, in that way, he is, he's going to use it to his advantage. And, and it gets away with it. And in the following scene, you know, it's even tenfold. There's a, uh, you know, a scene with, where two of the only people of color are the people being detained. And they're the only innocent people on the scene. So, and, it's, and I think in that moment, there's a, there's a shot of Rob. And he, the way he played it was so nuanced, where you kind of, where he has an exchange with another one of the characters. And, he, and he's basically saying to her, he's like, you and I both, we know, both know what's happening here. And you're not saying anything. I'm not saying anything. And I'm sorry that this is life in a weird way. Well, one of the things that's really notable about this movie is that you see you know, slices of life and people on screen that you don't normally see on screen. Like, I cannot think of another movie where I saw an accessoride van, <laughs> a driver, or any passengers on an accessoride van mm -hmm. on screen, and to be a kind of you know, plot point in the movie. Mm -hmm. So Josh and Benny, tell me about why you wanted to pe people the film that way and tell the story. I mean, it's set in Queens mm -hmm. very distinctly. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I can't speak speak really to uh, the, dis like everything was a decision, but, but I think that you know, when, we would, when we would write the movie, Ronnie and I, we, would, we knew Connie really well, we knew the scenario really well, and we would basically look at, you know, it's a thriller, so it's like, okay, what could this guy possibly do? And you know, he's at a hospital, and you know, we literally, I would go to Elmhurst, and I would just, Elmhurst is nicknamed Helmhurst, and it's a really, it's a despicable place, and and people, are ha this stuff happens all the time. They actually shut down the inmate wing. So, but so when I saw the accessoride there, there's a there's a certain level of um, uh, kind of uh, not laissez-faire, but just kind of negligence when you're working in the in the system and a municipal worker. You know, there's it's not there's like it's not designed to make you happy in a weird way. So you could actually get on to a place. So. It's a pragmatic decision, but then you get there, and I ride on an accessory ride, and you see, you know, the kind of did, like basically the forgotten ones in a weird way. You know, I'm not saying that from a high place. I'm just saying it. Like it really feels like, oh my God, no one's talking about these these people on on an accessory ride in the middle of the night leaving a hospital, and and it and it is and it's a very colorful place. It's a very people there, you know, have just as much to say as the next one. And and think, yeah. and when we shot that scene, we actually we had to cut it down so much because we. Don't just shoot things and see. We actually we, shoot it. Yeah, and we got, every person has a backstory. Yeah, and we, we got really, in, yeah. we got really into like seeing each person get off and where they lived and where they stayed, and that was really important. It became a story about the bus ride. Yeah, it, it, was it like, really did. It, it, it was like the first ten minutes. It was like eight. It was or a nine ten minute minutes. sequence yeah. of seeing it all, but just talking, what was what was um, Gladys talking about? That, that was a whole. Oh, there was oh, a whole okay. conversation she yeah. had with where she was talking about her husband. Gladys, who plays the Haitian grandmother of Crystal. But just like each to speak to just the casting aspect of it, each person has to be like a, a character who you feel their emotions. You know, you can understand them. And even if they are very briefly appearing on screen, you need to see them and understand them because we're not going to just, they're not going to just always, they, they're not throwaways ever. Each person is going to have their moment. And I think that every person you see in the movie has that weight. I mean, our, our casting department, they really, they don't, even extras casting, they don't, they, they interview people, you know, and they're not auditions. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I think as well, just in terms of the writing as well, I, I always found the things which were really thrilling in the script, it was the kind of unusual thing, the, the kind of the colloquial detail of something. I remember, I mean, a lot of it's cut out now, but when I was reading, because like normally you read scripts and it's, it's, they're already so cut down and it needs, it's just for pace and plot. And, blah, blah. and I remember that scene in Annie's house when he first got in and talking about 
it's, it's another lie, but talking, I'm making up what my mother works at the MTA and, and with what time, the hours of the MTA and all these like really, and well, it's just, why she won't get your phone call because mm -hmm. yeah, but it's, but, but it's a kind of, but it's like very, it was written very bluntly, like it's, like it's in a very conversational way, but like kind of very specific details, which like normally it would just, it's just like, who cares? It's like about, it's like, why do you need to add the stuff about the hours of the MTA? But when you're saying it and you try and figure out a way to deliver it, it makes it, so much easier to think of a performance because it's kind of, for one thing, it's just very unusual and it allows um, a lot of leeway to the way of character, way, what you can do with it. If you have like very uh, almost unemotive language, then you can go in a million different directions with it. But it's like a lot of the stuff in the writing was like just strange little details, which I always, I always really loved. We wanted this to really evoke what it actually feels like to be in jail. Uh, and and casting, we cast a lot of people who we knew, you know, through friends or through ca street casting or through outreach, where the inmates are people who are recently incarcerated, and the correctional officers are people who are recently are they recently retired or uh, were active correctional officers. So what you end up getting is when you watch these scenes, is you get this alchemy of of a reflection back at you because you have people who aren't necessarily playing and they're and they're bringing to you uh, you know that vibe yeah, and well you, you guys you, have a sense of realism on you yeah. in all your sets right I mean one of the things that you do is not necessarily shoot legally mm -hmm. right there's well, some uh, instances where you're stealing footage in, I don't in, know if there was that well, on in, this, in this case we did have the most permission we've ever had <laughs> but we just we pretended like we didn't have and we wanted it to feel like we didn't have any permission at all even though we had permission to go everywhere like for example when there's a scene where we're running through a mall flushing mall flood the flushing mall and we originally all right we only got like we're, we, Josh and I kind of like are conspiring how we're going to get this shot off and our locations manager is like you have the location like what are you doing it's like <laughs> we're setting up cameras we're going to steal it it's like so but that's how we approached the scene even though we had a, there yeah, was a, there's cop a detail there, you know? officer who was he's watching just, he's like look <laughs> he's like what he's like, look I'll, just don't hit anybody when you're running through is all he said to us so we we but, actually have a clip of that scene oh, can okay. we play that that last <laughs> clip please just keep your head now I'm gonna pull back off. Just don't say anything, all right? Okay. Don't look at them. Don't be scared. All right. Let me do all the talking. Hey, fellas, where are we going? Can I talk to you for a minute? First of all, could you take your hoodie off for me? Wait, what, what did we do wrong? No, hey, you, you with the black sweatshirt. Yo, my man, turn around. He's all right. We didn't do anything. Oh, oh, get back here! Go! Oh. some people in the audience kind of yeah. like jump back. So the, the guy who plays the officer who stops them is, is a guy whose entire family are cops. He's a court officer. And, and when he showed up to do the scene, he's just, he's like, oh, I know exactly. You don't have to give me the dialogue. I know exactly what I'm doing here. <laughs> and, 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 you know, the interesting thing about it was, and I talked to him about the scenario, like, we have a New York One segment. And instead of trying to write the New York One dialogue, I just said, how do you guys do a story? Like, oh, we received the information. He's like, oh, I'm going to give you all the information. You write the story. So I gave him all the information. He's like, why are we stopping these two guys? We're not looking for two white guys. And I was like, yeah, but their hoods are on. He goes, oh, so we don't know what race they are, so we're stopping them. And I was like, oh, OK, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what's happening here. And, and, and that, again, that alchemy, the way he's yelling, I mean, he's a very sweet guy, but the way he's yelling was just like, oh, you get, like, you get, I get tense, because I'm just like, oh, no. And, <laughs> but the fact that he was, you know, so involved with the police force 
the detail cop that day allowed us to do so much more than we were allowed to do in terms of the, you know, and, and, But yeah, from, from that, what we wanted to kind of preserve in that scene was the people in the shopping, the, the, the supermarket. We didn't want to announce to them, hey, we're going to run through here. So when we run through, don't look at us. We just wanted to run through and not have them look at us. It was, it was a much more, it was like kind of a very practical means of doing it. So we had the camera placed in one part and then one part, we had two cameras setting. We ran in unannounced and just kind of ran and tail slated it, which means we just sunk the sound afterwards after the take was done. But the idea of running through unannounced to the people there not the cop, but the people there, they were surprised by this. And then it was, it, even the fact that we were doing it three or four times again still was surprising, because they're like, hey, yes, it's for a movie, but it's still weird that these people are still running. So they're still going to look at Rob and I running through, but they're not going to look at the camera. And our, again, our casting is so accurate yeah. that when Benny runs into somebody, the cop is like, whoa, I told you you came there. So they're like, no, this is an actor. <laughs> Meet him, hello, nice. And yeah. then all of our cutaways are also of really perfectly cast, you know, uh, actors, actors. So, Rob, was it part of the appeal, too, for you once you got into the nitty-gritty that there was this sense of realism to the characters and the settings? Uh, yeah. I mean, I kind of, I mean, it's what really appealed to me in, in Heaven as well. Anyway, I, I kind of, I love it when uh, I just, I mean, I'm always just looking for, I just thought the performances were amazing in Heaven as well, and they're very, almost indistinguishable from, from documentary, and I was thinking, I just was curious how that, could work, and I think so much of it is just because, uh, you know, well, and heaven knows what was kind of different because you're shooting so wide, and so there's so many scenes where they're just people on the street, and there's nothing you can't, you just can't create it with extras or anything. It just doesn't look anything like it. Um, and I really wanted to be a part of that, and um, and I, yeah, I just I just knew I would react well in that environment. Well, the stakes are higher. You always talk about that and how the stakes are higher if you're acting up. Yeah, but, but even if it was just like, even like in the scene in the, in the mall in Queens, I mean, it's literally, the, the, it's kind of, it's, it's just different. It's like, it's, you're just doing it because you're doing it for real. Yeah. Like we're just running, we're running through a mall and like even the cops who are chasing us, there were so many people outside who were trying to like, trying to actively get in the way of the cops because they, they were trying to yeah. like, get away. <laughs> and it's like, it's, 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 it's interesting. It's like, it's just, it's really, it's, yeah. it's indistinguishable from reality. I mean, you're just running away from some cops. And yeah. so it's, I just, I always just try and do anything I can to not do any acting whatsoever. Well, when the, well, when the, what, what the, what the, when the detail cop said to us, just don't hit anybody, that's in a way the direction, you know? Yeah, okay, exactly. you can't hit anybody. So run through this crowd of, a massive amount of people and really bob and weave yeah. your way around. And to people get are like shouting at you and stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's just, a, it's just so much impetus around or impetite. You know. And that's just a way, yeah, the way the location can breed into the... the you know you know what's a fun, a fun joke to play on someone on the street? If you see a jogger, just get in front of him and start running as fast as you can and be like, stop! Yeah. Hey, don't chase He's me. Chasing me. He took my... Funny. That's a, ter that's a terrible like a, joke. That's, that's a, terrible a classic joke. Benny joke. I'll do that. I'll just be walking and I'll, I'll turn over and I'll, be, I'll get like kind of surprised as the jogger is approaching me. And then he'll just start sprinting. I'll sprint and then. Stop following me. And <laughs> eventually you're, you're always going to be chased by them. That's what's funny. <laughs> I don't know how that relates to this. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about the physicality of the running, because I'm always curious when you see an actor running in the movie, like especially a physicality of this character who's maybe different. It certainly is wearing different clothes, baggier stuff. Like, did you practice running in character? Um, I've actually done quite a lot of running in movies, and so I, I realized, even watching that then, like, I, I'm one of the only scenes in this movie where I'm kind of self-conscious about it because I feel like I'm exaggerating the running to make it look like it's faster because everyone was saying, like, make it look faster, but then <laughs> the camera couldn't move fast enough to actually run fast. <laughs> so you're kind of in this sort of halfway um, moment, uh, in this halfway kind Although of... Although what you don't moment. see is that it, what, it cut off right before you do a full-on sprint down the sidewalk, yeah. and that's like a full run because yeah. we literally had to have a, a big car driving. yeah. yeah. But, um, like a gazelle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a gazelle. But yeah, it was kind of, but I think it was, the, yeah, uh, a lot of the, sorry, what was the question? The physicality. <laughs> the physicality. We're talking about the physicality mm. of this character. Um, whether that was something that you worked on. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the majority came fr uh, from, I think, initially of 
just talking like it's kind of a voice I and mean, then you, you can't there's definitely a very specific New York kind of physicality and especially oh wait wait what, wait I want to know <laughs> what that is I think other New Yorkers in the crowd yeah. might want to know well I mean also and also a thing which people have been in prison I mean it's like there's definitely a very specific thing where it's kind of it, it's almost it's like a stance. I mean, you're kind of if you've have if you've been on, on edge like a lot of the time that you just have this kind of weird sort of um, just hyper alertness. Um, but uh, I think I think I, I really I really felt like a lot of as soon as you figure out an accent, it, it moves your face differently, and then it, then that moves your it informs the way your body moves afterwards. Um, and then obviously, like you know, the, on this, I was kind of a little. I thought a little bit differently because normally you go to a costume fitting and you put something on and say, like, "Ah, oh, this doesn't feel right," and then you just keep trying. You just go from thing to thing to thing until it feels right. Until you put something on, it feels right immediately. Josh had a, like a kind of whole little uh, closet of stuff. Like basically, as soon as I got there uh, to to New York, and um, I put it on, and it was kind of like things that. I sort of wore for a second when I was like 15, <laughs> and like, and I just I put it on, a, and I remember feeling sort of fake in it then. But I was like, no, this is definitely. And I remember like walking around Harlem and seeing characters who sort of appealed to me, and seeing them wear the same thing. And I was like, no, you just this is this is going to be the outfit. Just figure out how to move in it. Like a lot of the costumes and stuff we. Like Shoes. the main costume was bought head to toe off a, a person walking down the street, <laughs> like everything, off like a construction worker. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, the shoes, the, the, the shoes, like were very, like they were very important. Yeah, there was yeah, a, yeah. there was a book that I discovered in doing research, sitting in on arraignments at 100 Center Street. I, I met this guy who is a. Uh, uh, photographer for you know, Daily News, and he also photographed evidence for the NYPD, and he evident took photographs of the interior, the inside, the contents of this con man's bag, and one of the things in it was a book called Disguise Techniques Fool All the People Some of the Time, and there was a whole chapter about if you really want to blend in, sometimes you have to be louder. Yeah. If you're louder, you can blend in a little bit easier, and using fluorescent orange municipal working stuff, so I would Get talk to the costume department about this, and then we had a really hard time, because then it's like, Stuff was coming in. We couldn't find the right jacket. And then I was on my way to the production office in Queensbridge, and I saw a guy in the, the tobacco shop or whatever, the the bodega. And I was, just, I said, I texted the the um, the costume designers, and I was like, "This is it." They're like, "Okay, bring him back." So I remember I had this really weird 15-minute walk with this guy. Because he hated the jacket. He's like, you're going to buy this off me? I was like, absolutely. So then we, we were walking, and we were walking through a very desolate part of, of basically Long Island City near Queensbridge. And the further we got, he's like, is this, what is this? <laughs> and, and I was like, no, 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 don't worry about it. I promise you. And I pulled up my phone, and I showed him pictures of me on the internet. I was like, I'm actually a filmmaker. He's like, oh, OK. And then he's like, I don't want any funny business. I was like, don't worry, don't worry. And then I brought him up to our offices when we had, like, you know, and I brought, and he walked into like the costume department. and He saw like these racks of clothing. He's like, "Oh, okay." Yeah. And then he, yeah, that jacket ended up being the jacket that Connie wears the whole and, movie. And just, and then we had to find that one for again, the stunt yeah. double. And then it was like, "Oh my God, the jacket's like four hundred dollars," because it was like a flotation device from for people who worked at um, had an interior flotation device. People who work at LaGuardia. But the, just so. just to to go back and touch on what there's some, Rob said something interesting about how he kind of got into that New York mindset, which is was weird for me to hear because it was like he had looked and we had talked to all these people who were from Queens or who were from from New York in these areas and he would establish himself as like okay that's somebody Connie would know or that's somebody Connie maybe would have hung out with at some point in his life and then once he started like once we got to the point of the film where this is where Connie's life now moved he threw it all away and vehemently denied any connection to these people whatsoever and that gave a kind of swagger, like in a weird way, like, oh, you, oh yeah, I think I saw you there. You, you went to this school. No, I didn't go there. It's like, I didn't grow up here. I don't know you. And that inevitably turns into this weird, yeah, kind mm -hmm. of that pride, in, in, by, but by nature of ignoring and a kind of avoiding it is so, that but dichotomy is that's what you're saying strange. is the New York feeling? In a weird way, it was, it's, it was kind of spot on that like you don't want to be a part of, you kind of don't want to be a part of it. You just want to just do your own thing and you're, move forward. You know the I sidewalk think, really well. Yeah. yeah, I think that New York, I mean, my, what I associate with New York mainly is 
is being much just, I mean, on a really basic level, just being on the front foot more than like being reactive. Like, I mean, if you compare it to like, it's like the opposite of Portland. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, actually, well, no, Portland's probably not, no, that's more like friends. No, the opposite of like, uh, don't say anything. <laughs> but it is like what, like what, like what Josh is saying is like you, you, we wanted to make this movie, uh, like from the perspective of a New York, from New York, in the sense that you're looking down, you're looking at the sidewalk, you're not looking up at the buildings, you know, around you. So you, you really do have to locate yourself regionally, you know, and you have to look at the landmarks that you attach to. Or yeah, it's a very regional movie, obviously. You know, New York One is a huge piece of the movie. Well, one of the other things that um, is really notable about the movie is, is Benny, you play a character with a uh, developmental or mental disability. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you approach that. Yeah, it was, um, I think in 2010 with uh, Ronnie Bronstein, who Josh wrote the film with, we, we were going to make a movie together and, and we were trying to develop a character. And he asked me to look at myself and just moments of my life where I, something was kind of askew and look at my own emotional state of mind and what would happen if this was exaggerated or this was, went this way. And I kind of found parts of myself that I didn't know was there. And I developed this way of speaking. And it just became this guy, Jordan. And we had done a bunch of rehearsals. And we'd done, we had done tests. And it, we had developed this intense backstory that Ronnie looked at Josh and said, let's bring this character to the film. And once he was brought into the film, it, it opened up a lot of doors for the rest of the, the movie. But I, was never, I wasn't going to play the part. The backstory was there, but I wasn't going to play him. We actually looked at people with disabilities to play the role. But as we were interviewing them and some really great people, just the process of making the film would have kind of taken away some of their agency. Because we, we would have had to prod them or push them to do things that they felt were uncomfortable, which we were doing even kind of in, we could Physically, sense like a chase yeah, scene, you know. Chase scene is like well, these are these there's a lot of stuff that would have to happen speed wise that we would have to kind of really take something away from them that felt more immoral for us. And we, that's not how we want to make movies. So then it was like, okay, I'm gonna play this part. And so now what from two thousand ten until now, what happens to this guy Nick? And now his name is Nick and he's a little bit bigger, he's a little stronger. And that means that he can take what he wants. Because what he, he just wants to do what he wants. He doesn't want to be bothered. And his grandmother has kind of allowed that to happen. He's not, in the, he's not been in the system. So he's been kind of holding himself in. And now he's strong enough to kind of do that by himself. And so well, you we have a clip of that, okay. of, of you playing the part. We'll watch that last one. Nick, it's good that we should talk about this. Uh, this is good stuff we're talking about. Excuse me. Are you Peter? Yes, I am. We're in the middle of Nick, Hello. Nick, we're, what are you doing? We're in the middle of something here. We're in the middle on, of the exam. Hey, 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 Nick, about Nick. The, the, the pan and the Wait, chicken. wait, wait, please. Nick. How would you like it if I made you cry? How would you like that? No, I would not. But yeah, can, get up. But they, they told me I had to do this stuff. Let's go. Can let's go. No, but he wrote me. He tells all my stuff. Shut up, then. This is my work. This is my stuff, OK? Oh, shame on you, kind brother. Shame on me? You're not helping. Shame on you. Shame on you. So, so Benny, you've acted before, but but not opposite somebody like Rob. What was that feeling like for you? Well, it was. Um, we had done we had done a bunch of um, character rehearsals before the, we started making the the movie, just to kind of develop the brother relationship, and just for me to see what uh, Connie would be like with with Nick, and for for Rob to see what it was like to have a brother who had a disability like this, and and it just it added just some weight for us to bring to the film that wasn't, even though we were kind of estranged from one another, that's the backstory of the characters. We don't really know each other that well, and we're kind of getting reacquainted with each other. But this added, if you were to break him out from this facility and take him on, you'd have to deal with some things. And, and maybe Connie isn't going to recognize that, but there's going to be consequences to those actions. But just in that scene, there was what, what I kind of realized right away was I can't myself as Benny can't be aware of the difference between Nick and myself. You know, if Nick feels something, it's very different than what I feel. And I'm aware that Nick can't feel something, but I can't show that in the performance because Nick isn't aware of that difference. So I'm not going to play down to the character. I'm just going to be the character. And I think that for, for me, it was helpful to talk to some of these people. And also just with Rob, when we were 
doing these these kind of these exercises in like car washes and just in just in like Dunkin' Donuts and Yonkers, just kind of just being, going out in character, just being, yeah, being these characters. It really just allowed you to to feel the feelings and and not just play the feelings. I th I can say from my point of view in the elevator scene that kind of follows this when they're going down. That was t kind of towards the end of the first day or one of the towards the end at least. Uh, and Rob and Benny like. I remember I just told the DP, I, I just said, find, find, find their relationship. And I just let him roam. And it got very intimate really quickly. And, and Rob was elevating it with his performance and being extra loud yeah. and, and was kissing like, Benny and almost are, yeah. obsessively so. And it was, that was interesting because it was like, OK, this is, this is the first day of shooting. And, and it was, and you know, we had just previously shot a very emotional scene that opens the movie. And, and it was just like, OK, this is, these two people actually, we actually, I actually feel like they are brothers, and there is this feeling of that Nick saw his brother as like the bad apple of the family, Connie, and that, but Nick never really understood what a bad apple even was. Right. So it's like, why is he never allowed to hang yeah, out? Yeah, and, and coming from that scene before, you don't get the sense that somebody would be, in a way, allowed to kind of hug Nick or kiss Nick in a way, because he would immediately push away. But the fact that he is kind of overwhelmed by the fact that he's seeing this this guy who he hasn't seen in a while. So, so one of the things that's interesting about all you guys is you um, all started in your field pretty young, and teenagers, young adults, you know, early 20s. Was this something that you envisioned? I mean, being in a car wash in Yonkers, <laughs> you know, a few years down the line in character. What did you think that you might? What did you think you might you might make out of this career when you started, Rob? Um. I mean, I, I'm really I'm sort of redeveloping my uh, well, uh, my expectations every year. I mean, uh, with this, it's this kind of, uh, like working in the car wash or whatever. I I, feel, I sort of felt that um, it'd be just very difficult to to do that. And it's kind of you know I remember when I first started, uh, basically the last time I was kind of doing. Character, like character work, whatever you'd call it, was this movie like years ago called uh, Little Ashes, and I remember like just kind of just me. It was playing young Salvador Dali, and uh, I remember going to a lot of people's houses who knew Dali, and it's just so different when someone has like literally zero expectation. You're just a random person, and it's sort of, and it's you can get so much more out of it, and you can, and you know, and a lot of the time in the same way. That, Kind of manipulates people. I mean, you kind of, you want to get on someone's level to kind of get secrets and stories, and you don't want to have just the kind of uh, just the front from someone. And as soon as people know who you are, like you can't like it's it's much more difficult to kind of to to, to lie basically. Um, and I think you know when we we're doing this, like, like working in a car, it's not really lying, but it's kind of we we're basically in disguise doing it. Like we were, and, and we wanted to have the I, I was, but really wanted to have the reaction from people around, like you know, behave as a character and see just kind of it's not even how someone would talk to you, just how someone would look at you, um, and you can really you can really feel it um, if you're in if you're in the right place. Are you any good at washing cars? I didn't. I was basically yeah. managing Benny doing it. Yeah, uh, yeah. But the, but that was the, the concept of this. Yeah, scene, yeah. You know? yeah the, it was it was a, a tamer version of the beginning of the movie where he's like, okay, I can take you somewhere and you can do something, and I can prove to you that you can do it on your own. And it didn't go well. You yeah, know, for for the situation. But. Yeah, the, everybody else in the car wash was extremely worried. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think that we have a, a couple minutes for some audience questions. So we'll have some mics for you guys. If you want to just raise your hand, and the mic people will come to you. And uh, when you ask your question, when you get the mic, please stand up as well so you can be seen by um, the folks at home watching online. We have a question over here. Um, my question is, you said you did a lot of research into prison. Um, I actually work in a mental health background, how much research did you do with that in that area? A, a lot. Uh, you know, we part of the, uh, weirdly part of the casting process went into uh, 
a, an extensive interviewing and uh, workshopping. But the workshopping we were doing wasn't acting based. It was it was really just getting to know people, and and there was a handful of people that we did multiple sessions with, and and uh, a lot of taping, and that ended up being very 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 um, informative. You know, I remember working with Ronnie, and and you know, if you go back to 20, 2010, you know, Ronnie, my co-writer, his his wife is is uh, involved in you know. She had the real exam exactly. that I would have to that I would take, and I would take that exam in character. And what we also did was we had. It, there's a scene in the jails where there was a we had a real pro public defender come in and talk to Nick and try and explain to Nick what was going to happen, and I think she said something like where she was. It was so strange for her because she didn't realize the impact of her words that the way that she would describe something to to Nick would be confounded in his head as being like okay you're going to be here for a long time but he took that as I'm going to be here forever right. you know that there's that disconnect and she, it really affected her and it, she's like this is going to help me in my field as a lawyer going forward because I now know that going uh, that this is how I have to speak and I have to be aware and also the amount of people in jail who actually have yeah, mental that should be disability known. Yeah. you know these there's not much of a distinction there yeah that like I think it's something it was like 40 or 50 percent are there and it's and they don't it's like they, they don't understand that that's such a dangerous place to be right. if you don't understand this, like the societal aspects of, of prison. Because you can't, it's very hard to be in society in that way, too. It's interesting that you say that because the, the, the lady, the actress who plays his lawyer, uh, Rachel, she is an actual public defender. And sh they do exercises in, in when, you're, when they're becoming uh, lawyers where they have basically mock uh, not mock trials and mock interviews and mock meetings with people who are locked up, and you know obviously you're not getting great talent like Benny, you know who's there. People are just basically reading off of a page, okay. so it was. She said it was very very informative for her to to actually experience. You know like a, not it wasn't almost didn't even feel like a dry run. So thank you. Yeah. Of course, thank you for thank the you. I, I have some questions also from Facebook Live while we get the mics passed around. So Christina asks. Um, for all of you, what do you feel is the mission of the movie, or what do you want people to take away from it? You want to go? I want me to go. I'll take um, it. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess. Yeah. The the mission of the movie. Um, it's almost like you you attach yourself to a character and you move at a certain speed, and when you get to the end, you kind of look back and think, "Huh, what did I just experience? You know, what what happened? Why did this happen? Why did this happen?" You start questioning. The decisions, but while you're on the ride, you're just on this propulsion forward, and you're not really thinking about it in the same way. But it's that pause that's yeah. very important. I mean, our 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 immediate intent with the movie was to make a piece of pulp, something yeah. that felt dangerous, and that something that you know most pulp that was made, you know now, it as, reflects, as, yeah. as, as, you know basically, uh, culture at large can now say like, oh, this is important, what well, that's important, but. At the time, it was just considered disposable and almost dangerous and immoral. It was just kind of like, I don't want anything to do with that. So we wanted to kind of engage with that pulp and, and basically reflect, take this story and have it be a thrilling movie that feels very thrilling because it feels so authentic to what life is like. So we wanted to take life and reflect it back, but warp it through this kind of genre genre film. And, and I mean, the instinct originally is to just make a popcorn movie as something that like termite art you know that that people can consume and move with at the speed of which Connie's moving through the movie but then later on go back and reflect and ask themselves well wait a second that was interesting why did that happen just like at the end of the movie not going to ruin it but you're kind of you've gone through this propul this kind of propulsive story Pause. and then you're just kind of let out and you're just kind of like well wait a second the what about, these, yeah, what about like, these people? The perspective yeah. will switch, and you're just like, huh? Like, and you're kind of like, it's almost like somebody shook you, and you're just now, you, you're like, wait a second, oh yeah, huh? That's that's how it should be, you know? Rob, you wanted to spend a lot of time in Queens. What? Uh, <laughs> for the uh, movie? Yeah, I mean, well, it's difficult for me to, for me to know what the message was. I mean, I, I like now, I guess I, I've talked about it a bunch, so I kind of think there's some kind of retrofitted message. But I mean, initially, I just. Just want to find it's, you find something which has just got very um, the 
kind of angular dialogue and it just feels new and and it's just got so much energy because it's kind of uh, it's, it's so difficult to generate that level of energy especially when there's so there's so many people making content and when you have one thing which is like wow yeah. like i mean it's really really rare and uh yeah that's all that's kind of what i wanted about it and uh, and also it's kind of you know the, i mean for me anyway it's like a, it's like a it's like a fantasy figure character like it's kind of you know it's like uh yeah, it's like sunny. And dark See, afternoon. I think it's actually well, interesting to say we, we had. Well, I raised that. Edit well, that out. <laughs> that's not. That was not. No, I didn't hear what you said. Okay, what, what's, maybe what's, I haven't said it quite enough. That's not. I mean, it's like it's from that kind of. <laughs> rewind it. I didn't race. even hear what you well, said. We okay, struck good. that already no, from the rewind. conversation. It, I was just what I was. I was just thinking about something else. I thought they would. They answered just, the question. Well, yeah, no. The, I didn't hear what was said. The, <laughs> an interesting thing to say uh, along lines of Josh saying we wanted to make a popcorn movie. We had our runtime in mind before we even set out. We had our runtime in mind before we even set out on it. Like we didn't want it to be over a hundred minutes, and we got it to a hundred minutes. But it was like this, the pace was so important from the beginning. You know? Yeah. Speaking of time, we have a couple. <laughs> we have like one more minute for a question. We have, we have a question back there. Okay. Hey, I see you guys. I thanks see you. a lot for sharing your process. This is fascinating stuff. But as you were playing the clips, I was watching you guys, and you all looked like you'd never seen it before. You were so <laughs> intent. I'd like to know what you were thinking. <laughs> And I'd like to hear that from all of you. So what were you guys actually thinking about when you watched those clips? It's, it's, it's yeah, the only time, while making this movie, we, we approach it like, like a construction site, not like making a movie. You know, we were really just trying to get it done in the best way possible. And that's kind of like what I think maybe fueled some of the energy behind it. So when, we, when the clips are played, I can't help but watch it and be like, I, maybe did we get it? Like, could we have done something different? Or like, I think we might have gotten that down there. So there is a, a, a kind of a looking at it with fresh eyes in a way, and especially watching it with an audience. I want to know how an audience we're, is going to react. We're not allowed to, to admire our craft. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. No, no, no. I, no, no. I, I, it is. It, it, it is. You know, I can watch it. I, I, when we premiered the movie in Cannes, it was in the room with like 2,000 people, and that place is filled with so much scrutiny. People, there's like, you know, it's a tough place to premiere a movie. So I was sitting next to him, and I, I literally just looked at the screen, and I don't think I, I was just counting down, okay? This was 98 minutes, 97 <laughs> minutes. It's a long, long 100 minutes. Th this is, and this I, was but different. It's, but it's, but it's, but people come up to me like, that movie felt like 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, so time is so relative. So to watch it now, engage in a conversation in a room, there's a sense of finality that is, and you can be pr I'm yeah. proud, you know. And, and, and just, yeah, talking about our process, it's like, I'm, I want to see if I'm actually making any sense, you know. It's like, <laughs> I'm like, did, did that make sense? With, because like, you're like, oh, we actually have a clip of that. I'm like, damn. <laughs> it's like, now you can see if it's exposed or not. <laughs> All right, Were you it? watching even, Rob? Do we have time for uh, one more question? Uh, yes. Yeah, I think I was just yeah, do you, Rob, do you watch your movies later? Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I had a similar experience in Cannes with, with that when time just felt like it was just warping in front of me. Um, but yeah, I mean, with this, it's, um, it's also, you know, when you have a nice experience doing something, it's like looking at even however, however traumatic this, the, char the scenes the characters go through, I mean, I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's a nice day. <laughs> All right, we do have one more question over here. Um, the very first movie I ever saw Rob Pattinson in, in the theater was The Rover. So I think he can do anything, yeah. including play a, a Hasidic Jew. <laughs> <laughs> he tells me that all the time. <laughs> My question is, you, have you begun filming the movie? And if so, is there any other role Rob could play <laughs> in Uncut Gems? It's and Rob, I just have an, another question, quick one. In uh, Cosmopolis, David Cronenberg is actually Jewish, but there was not one Hasidic Jew on 47th Street in the Diamond District in that movie. <laughs> Did you ever ask him about that? I mean, because was, was, was the whole thing was in a warehouse in Toronto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that. Just so you know, the, the 47th Street is the, it's the, the landscape is more Bukharian Jew. It's a different type of. Has it, has it changed? It has, yes. yeah. yeah. And, well, and we, Jacob the jeweler changed everything, man. <laughs> 
What's that? I haven't been to New York since the. For, oh yeah. For anybody who's watching at home, she's she's asking about a street in New York that is filled with diamond and jewelry shops. Yes. That is. Which our dad worked at. He was a runner right. for it, it, a guy it's, there. It was always. Yeah. Okay, so let's yes. at, let's let's let you guys answer the question, which is about your uh, possible next. Project. Yeah. So we're we're likely shooting at the top of the year next year, and uh, yeah, Rob, Rob's always saying to me, he's like. Come on, I can do it. Uh, <laughs> but I, but I, I agree. He, I believe he can do anything. But they're, they're really. I'm not interested in him playing a cameo. Uh, I mean, right, I'm, but I, I also thought maybe it was maybe not that he couldn't, but maybe that he should politically. Politically, I don't care. No, I mean, See, I, yeah, I it was, it was just. <laughs> well, he, he just, it, he, he, yeah, he. I have a hard time seeing him as, as like a, a. a, a well, let's let, let's, yeah. let, let's let Rob answer, and then we'll wrap up. Go ahead. <laughs> Do you want to? Rob wants if, if it. I, like it's to prove I can be Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> a Bukhari. I can. <laughs> I can. <laughs> and what? Benicia del Toro. Benicia del Toro in uh, Snatch. I mean, he's he's yeah, he's robbing. Uh, he's doing it to rob. I mean, it's. <laughs> I'm joking. You know, I, listen. I I think that uh, um, we're gonna work together again. Yes. It, you know, it, it's absolutely going to work together. Again. There we yeah. go. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. You've been a terrific audience. Thank you guys Thank again. You guys. For Thank us. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you for everything.